Professor Menigan, first, let me just say how honored we are that you've agreed to be interviewed in this series. Uh, one of the things that people in the field, China Christianity Studies, have said about you is that uh, you have you, you changed the field a little bit because you, you began with your first publication, one of your first publications on the great Jesuit in China, uh, Giulio Olani. And then, uh, and then you did something almost radical. You wrote about the Dominicans in Fujian. <laughs> and so often people think, oh, we only write about the Jesuits, but you, you began this new uh, trend of writing also about the mendicants. Uh, yes. the, the, the goal here really is for you to speak about yourself. I'll keep my introduction very brief. But uh, Professor Menigan, you've published a tremendous amount of articles and, and given a lot of uh, papers, talks. Uh, I, I hear a rumor that you presented a recent talk on, uh, I believe, sort of aristocratic European women and their connection to the Jesuits in China, which is, you know, one of the other scholars in the interview said to me recently, uh, I wish uh, the scholars would speak more about the women. So uh, I think many people would be happy to hear about that. But, but uh, let's just get to the first question and, and then I'll let you answer. The first question really, Professor Menigan, is what brought you to the field of China Christianity studies? And if you might even add to that, what, what attracted you to the specific topics about which you've researched? Yes. So I was trained in Chinese studies at the University of Venice, Ca Foscari. Uh, I actually, when I started in 1985 as an undergraduate, I had never met anybody from China. I had never eaten Chinese food, which was quite possible in the 80s in Italy, where I'm from. Um, this is something that, of course, in the US would be impossible, even in small places there is always a, at least a Chinese restaurant uh, and I took some courses there in Chinese history actually um, I did four years of uh, Chinese language and civilization and uh, uh, we could choose uh, uh, to do an historical track so that's what I did and uh, professor Adriana Boscaro uh, who was now already retired, uh, who had been working on uh, uh, the relations between Japan and Europe uh, in the 16th century. She wrote one of the early books uh, in Europe uh, about uh, the famous uh, uh, Japanese embassy organized by Valignano to Europe, uh, was one of my teachers. She taught uh, uh, a series of courses uh, uh, entitled History of Explorations of Asia, and one course was about the Middle Ages and the imaginary of China at the time of Marco Polo and the stories of Priester John and so on. And the second one was entitled Adventures and Misadventures of the Jesuits in China and Japan. And so I took um, uh, that course and that really started uh, uh, to whet my appetite for studying the history of relations between East Asia and Europe, and in particular China, of course, my specialty. Um, also because um, I very soon realized that as an Italian, uh, I had uh, uh, at my disposal a lot of archives in Italy that in fact uh, had been underused. Uh, there's still so much to explore in these uh, archives. Uh, of course, uh, the record is mainly missionary records, uh, but they also have a lot to say about the history of China in general. Uh, at a time when uh, Europe knew relatively little about China, the missionaries were really the conduit and uh, for knowledge about China. Um, and I have spent the last five years working on the Propaganda Fide archives, which was a very neglected archive. People had not really done very much in those archives, and there's incredibly valuable material there. Once again, that it is not Jesuit. So you mentioned the fact that I chose as uh, the topic of one of my monographs, uh, the Dominicans in China. And in part, I did that as a reaction to the... Um, obsession almost on the Jesuits. Obviously, Jesuits are very important in the China field. They are the uh, 
founders of Western Sinology. They did tremendous work. But I realized in the 80s and 90s when uh, there was a new flourishing of the field uh, uh, led by people like uh, Zach Gernet, uh, Eric Zürcher and his students, uh, Standard, uh, Duding, uh, Golvers, others, uh, of course, David Mungello, that uh, um, there was a lot of attention given to the Jesuit, much less to other orders. But also I was very interested in controversy and controversy on the ground. And that's why actually I studied the Dominicans in a local context, uh, in Fujian, where the Chinese rights controversy actually physically started. And so I was really curious to clarify what was going on in this community. Was it any different than a, a Jesuit community? And so that's, that's why I'd say um, I, I moved in that direction. And I think, you know, this explains a little bit my long time uh, interest for this. It's also personal because I am a, a Westerner who studies China and I always have identified with many of the um, conundrums, uh, many of the attitudes of these earlier generations of Westerners going to China, finding the difference but also the commonalities and uh, trying to understand. And so I think that's the job of a lot of, of us in uh, who do ch Chinese history and Chinese studies, is really try to understand and translate China for a Western public. You know, one of the things you mentioned in that answer is your interest in the propaganda fide. And um, I remember in my own research there, the, uh, the archivist said they have no idea how much they have. There is so much that's even unprocessed. So it's a very rich, a very rich archive. Indeed. And uh, I spent uh, almost five years uh, researching only a, a tiny part of it. I mean, I went through most of the materials uh, for the pre-Opium War period, uh, but trying to focus in particular on Beijing. Beijing is actually uh, my current project. I'm interested in the life of Europeans in Beijing during the long 18th century, and that is in fact uh, mainly about missionaries. And uh, the propaganda fide uh, mission, uh, Propaganda Fide was the uh, Ministry of Missions of the Holy See, uh, was the smallest of the missions in China and uh, certainly the smallest also uh, in Beijing. But uh, its archives have been preserved uh, uh, almost intact, uh, unlike what has happened with uh, the archives, for example, of the Jesuits in China and especially in Beijing. The houses, uh, uh, you know, you yourself have done research on uh, the Beitang and so on. The archives of the French Jesuit, of the Portuguese in Beijing have mostly disappeared. Uh, these are the local archives, I mean, that w would have been so rich for understanding the daily life, for understanding the properties, uh, uh, that the real estate, uh, the daily uh, liturgical cycle, uh, of the communities of Beijing and Northern China, all of that uh, is mainly gone. We still have very rich materials in Rome, in Paris, uh, elsewhere, but not these local archives. And the propaganda actually offers an alternative because a lot of the materials through the archives of the procurator who was uh, established by propaganda in Macau and then at sometimes in Canton and then moved to Hong Kong uh, have been preserved. So you really have this sort of fabric uh, of daily life. Right, you know, and, and this, this, this discussion of archives leads us to the second question, which is uh, related to research. And the question that we've been asking each scholar is, if you could describe perhaps a moment, because you're a historian, which is very different than being, say, a theologian. You know, theologians say they layer knowledge upon their topic, but historians often talk about a eureka moment. Was there ever a moment in your research uh, that you discovered something that helped you reframe how you think about your topic or, or changed how you think about your topic? I'd say that it was my visit in uh, 1996 uh, to this uh, county in northeastern uh, Fujian, which is at the core of uh, my book, Ancestors, Virgins, and Friars. Uh, this is the county of Fuan uh, uh, in the region of Mindung. And uh, uh, why do I say that? Because uh, 
Before leaving, I had done, of course, my due diligence uh, by collecting as much material as possible on that place. Uh, there is uh, an incredibly detailed history in Spanish by Jose Maria Gonzalez, a Dominican historian, on that mission. And so I really looked into that. I knew that there were archives uh, in Manila, in Avila, and uh, across Europe. But the one question mark was, is there anything left in this place itself? Uh, are there sources, are there people who can talk about uh, the lived experience of Christianity in this place? And uh, I remember that uh, at the time I went to Fujian Shefantashi, uh, Fujian Normal University, where Professor Lin Jingshui, a very famous historian of Christianity in China, was my sponsor at the time, uh, to do research in the local library, in the provincial library. And I really wanted to go to Fuan. And I remember that there was some resistance because uh, Fuan was uh, a very delicate place to go to. There still uh, there were a lot of... Uh, um, conflicts between the so-called underground church and the official church and the government. But also scholars were telling me there are no more sources. There is nothing there. And then I went there first with Professor Lin Jingshui, and this was more of an official visit with a lot of uh, uh, local uh, cadres. So no, not really a lot of time to do anything in particular. Uh, but the second time I went back with one of his master's students, Zhang Xianqing, Professor Zhang Xianqing now, he is a, a major professor at Xiamen University. He has written himself a book on Fuan. And what was uh, extraordinary is that uh, we actually found sources. We found uh, testimonies. We found uh, even inscriptions, uh, genealogies. And uh, later on, Zhang Xianqing, who is a local scholar and uh, of course, uh, uh, had the time and also the connections to do it a, a much better, uh, in a much better way than I could, went back and found incredible sources and discovered things such as uh, the existence of uh, uh, branches of lineages that have been Christian for uh, centuries uh, and the acceptance within uh, even the genealogies of the presence of these Christians, even of Christian women, of Christian virgins. So really new things, new sources. That was the ha-ha moment where I said, I was stubborn and I, I thought I would go and try and see what was there. And uh, I discovered things uh, and uh, together with Chinese scholars, uh, we really opened up uh, uh, some new sources and that was really wonderful. Um, yeah, I would say that was one of the discovery moments in my career. It's interesting that you mentioned this time that you spent with uh, Zhang Xianqing, who when, when scholars think of your book um, on the Dominicans in Fujian at Fuan, often people pair your book with uh, Professor Zhang Xianqing's book. Yeah. So, you know, uh, many scholars say you have to read both to get a, a very complete image of, of the Christianity in that area. You also mentioned that that, that was a, a particularly profound moment of almost collaborative research in China. But uh, maybe you've already answered question three, but do you have uh, another particularly meaningful moment of research in China, could be elsewhere, that you'd like to, uh, to, to recall? Sure, I have a couple of uh... Uh, examples that I can uh, give you. The first uh, is uh, something that happened when I was still an undergraduate, uh, studying for uh, one year as a foreign exchange uh, student at Renmin University in Beijing. Um, I had been sent with a scholarship, uh, by national scholarship of the Chinese government with the Italian government uh, to study language. And uh, I also attended some courses at the Institute of Qing History. Uh, which is quite famous at uh, Renmin University. And uh, that year, 1990, actually there was an, the ordination of a few bishops in uh, Taiyuan in Shanxi. And uh, um, these were uh, official bishops. Mm -hmm. And uh, a small group uh, of uh, foreigners, uh, it was uh, uh, Father Angelo Lazzarotto, who is you know, well known in the field as well, himself, uh, could say is uh, uh, both a missionary but also an historian of, Ch of Chinese Christianity. 
Um, and Bernardo Cervellera, who is now, I think, still the director of Asia News, uh, which is this uh, uh, Catholic news agency in Italy, as well as two journalists from uh, UCAN News, which is the um, Asian uh, United Catholic uh, uh, News Agency, traveled uh, to this event, to the ordination. And uh, Father Angelo invited me to go along. And I was very excited, you know, just this young undergrad. Uh, I didn't know uh, a lot about the church in China in its lived experience at the time. And after the ordination, we traveled and we were, the we were told we were the first group of foreigners ever to do so after 1949 to uh, this famous shrine of Our Lady of the Seven Sorrows, which is in a village near Taiyuan, Tungargo, uh, which has become more famous uh, recently because also of the studies by Henrietta Harrison uh, of these areas. Um, and uh, the church had been just reconstructed at the time. The road uh, was uh, built by the Christians. And uh, while our minivan was going up this uh, countryside road, uh, not asphalted, we saw a group of pilgrims and they were kneeling on the road every so many hundreds of meters, praying and then standing up and going up. We arrive on top of this hill and there's this incredibly strange Baroque style church on top of the hill. But the most incredible thing was when we returned because when we arrived down the hill into this village where people lived at the bottoms of the hills, and a lot of the people at the time still lived inside caves. This is typical of this region. We found the entire village outside. I think it was at least four or 500 people. And they all knelt down in front of these foreign priests. And the head of the village came with a bottle of holy water and he asked the priest to bless them. I mean, I had never seen something like that. I felt like, where am I? This is another time, another space. Uh, um, you know, hundreds of people just kneeling and asking to be blessed. And then uh, there were, uh, then we visited the house inside the cave of the head of the village uh, with all these images of the Virgin Mary and Catholic images on the walls. That was really incredible. I will never forget that experience. And then the second one happened in 2015 when I was doing research online on uh, uh, George Robert Lure. He's also one of the early pioneers on this, of the study of Chinese Western relations, especially of art. He wrote the first scientific biography of uh, uh, Giuseppe Castiglione, the famous uh, uh, Jesuit painter in 1940 in Italian. And uh, I was interested in him and uh, the history of his own family. He was actually um, descendant of uh, the, the nephew of uh, uh, John Young Allen, the famous uh, missionary in Shanghai from the Southern Methodist Church, a giant really in the history of uh, modern Protestant missions. And he himself was head of the language department at Yanjing University between the 1920s and the 1940s. But there was a twist to this, because why did he, did he go to Italy, for example, to earn uh, a, a laurea in art history in, during the fascist era? Why did he write his first book, uh, and only book, uh, on Castiglione in Italian, published by the Institute for uh, the Middle East and the Far East uh, in Rome, which was, of course, at the time supported by the fascist regime, uh, there was something interesting, this Italian dimension. And so I was interested in understanding more about his life. And I did understand that there was actually an Italian connection that in fact, uh, as a child together with his mother and his brothers, uh, his brother and sisters, he had actually lived in Italy, in Florence, studied Italian. That's why he was uh, um, a polymath uh, that knew so many languages. Even if he had been born in Shanghai, lived there as a child, and I became curious, you know, he, he died in 1974 and uh, his last publication, which was posthumous, was... So um, after then the publication in 1976 of this entry on Castiglione, 
we lose completely track of Robert, uh, uh, George uh, Robert Lure. And uh, um, a few years ago, Suna Ken, the famous historian of the Qing dynasty at uh, Princeton, uh, wrote an article on Castiglione and as an appendix, she had uh, um, a sort of belated memorial to George L Robert Lure, uh, analyzing a little bit uh, uh, what uh, his contribution as a pioneer in the field had been. And I became really curious. She tried to figure out uh, who uh, the members of his family were, and she was wondering what happens to, him, to his papers uh, and to his research after 1974. So I started looking online on the internet, and I found actually a nephew. Uh, I mean, at the beginning, I didn't know if he was, but uh, someone related to him uh, in uh, uh, California. And I did so actually looking at some of the genealogical records that are available on these new websites out there. There is a lady in Texas, in fact, who has uh, um, become a devout uh, uh, researcher of uh, uh, Americans who died in Asia mm -hmm. and uh, American cemeteries in Asia. And so she has been collecting all kinds of materials uh, on expats uh, from the late 19th uh, into the 20th century. And she is the one who gave me the certificate of death of Robert Lure. I realized that he had died in France uh, in the house of uh, a friend, a sinologist. And then I found the name of his family members in Italy. So that's how I could go back and find this relative in California. And he replied and he told me, yes, he was my uncle. But uh, if you want to know anything more, you need to call my sister. She lives in Italy, in Rome, and she has all his papers. Wow. So I uh, got in touch. She at the beginning was a little spooked. How do you know so much about us? What's going on here? And then we became great friends. She's a lady in her 80s, Marisa Saetti, and uh, she now lives in Cortona, this near Cortona, this beautiful town in Tuscany. And actually she had all these boxes in her basement uh, that she had never opened. So I visited uh, with uh, uh, a friend, um, Marco Musillo who is uh, uh, an historian of uh, art and specializes in Castiglione. And we opened those boxes and we found the notes, we found a lot of materials, including more than 40 rare books from the 16th to the 19th century. And she didn't know even they were there. there. And so that was a, a great experience again. And we have become friends. I interviewed her. Her personal story, the story of her family is absolutely incredible. She was in a Japanese concentration camp uh, at age five uh, in China. Um, her uncle was in the same concentration camp. Uh, then, uh, uh, you know, he traveled uh, back to Italy after the war and he lived with the family of his sister and with his niece in Italy. And that's why the papers are there now. So really interesting and in unexpected discoveries. What a great story. You know, I should know this, but have you published about her yet or? So uh, actually a volume came out uh, uh, recently. Uh, it, it's uh, edited uh, by Hartmut Wallravens, this famous scholar in Germany. Uh, it's entitled uh, George Robert Lohr Jr. and uh, uh, his research on the Beijing uh, um, Jesuit artists. Uh, it's. Uh, actually a German translation of many of the writings by um, Lure himself, but it also contains in English uh, a transcript that I made with some annotations uh, of an autobiographical uh, essay that uh, Lure himself wrote at the age of 19, when he was uh, uh, actually a freshman at Emory University, and then he went back to it uh, uh, when he was a senior about to uh, graduate, describing his life from birth to that point. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting. And I included some of the photos from the collection of Marisa Saiti of the family. Oh, this is, this is quite good to hear. Well, you know, now that you mentioned uh, uh, another scholar, that leads us very seamlessly into the next question. Um, and that is, if, if you know, we've, Obviously, we're most interested in, in you and your experience, but we're asking every scholar to recall something about another scholar, maybe a pleasant memory, something that you recall can recall about another scholar that you think is important 
for the field to remember? Well, I don't know if it is for the field uh, to remember. Uh, in, in, I have a couple of uh, examples. Um, the first uh, regards uh, uh, Father Roman Malik, uh, who was uh, uh, the director for many years of the Monumenta Serica Institute uh, in St. Augustine, outside of Köln in Germany. And uh, I went to my first ever academic conference in St. Augustine in 1992. It was a conference on uh, Adam Charles von Bell. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I had simply submitted my abstract, which was out of my BA thesis at the University of Venice. Um, so they didn't know me. They simply thought, okay, you know, we can invite this scholar. And when I still remember showing up and Father Malik looking at me and says, goodness, I thought I would see an old scholar with a long beard and hair. Here you, we have this young guy, and I, I was very young, very inexperienced, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, star-eyed, uh, meeting all these scholars that I had heard about. So that was a, a very nice experience, and actually I always stayed in touch with the Father Malik. I would say that uh, I've never seen anybody work so hard. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a chain smoker, working into the night, uh, editing the journal, doing all kinds of activities. I really admired him. Uh, that, of course, shortened his life because uh, he really uh, worked himself to death, but uh, I have a lot of admiration for him. And the other one is Father Edward Malatesta, the founder of the Ricci Institute at the University of San Francisco. He is really the one who helped me a lot at the very beginning of my career. I got a Fulbright scholarship to come to the US to study uh, uh, for a master in Asian studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, but without uh, the support, even financial support, at the time he was able to find some uh, scholarship for me, of Father Malatesta, and especially this home that I found in San Francisco at the Ricci Institute, really, I don't think I could have developed uh, as a scholar as I did. And really, Father Ed was a visionary. He saw into the future, for example, the 21st century Ricci roundtable that he established in the 1990s was ahead of its time. So he really saw things that we are doing only now at a really, uh, level of professionalism that he was uh, hoping to, to get to. Uh, but of course, he was also uh, a Jesuit priest. Uh, he was someone who loved China and the idea of mission. He combined the scholar and uh, the, the, the pastoral uh, dimensions in, in his life. And I really admired that. And of course, you know, he had lived in Italy many years. He was a professor at the Biblicum in Rome at the Gregorian University. So we could speak in Italian, we could speak, uh, he could speak perfectly French, uh, always with his nice, uh, you know, American accent. He spoke uh, Chinese, he preached. Uh, um, I had a lot of admiration for him. And so I'd say that's another uh, of uh, the, the great scholars. Uh, and men and, and, and persons that I've met in this field that I really admire. You know, you're the first person to mention Father Malik, and I'm glad that you did. Uh, many people have mentioned Father Malatesta, and so many people have said, you know, when we think about Father Malik and Father uh, Malatesta, I, I have personally not met either of them, but um, people say that Father Malik was the better scholar, but Father Malatesta was kind of pastoral, do you think that's true in describing the two priests? Well, um, I would say that uh, uh, Father Malik had explored beyond the history of Christianity in China. Mm -hmm. His specialty was actually Taoism and Chinese religions. He had a PhD in the history of Taoism. He had written a dissertation on the concept of Jai or uh, uh, purification uh, in the Taoist tradition. So really, he was someone who had a very broad view of the field and could be the uh, general editor of the journal, the Monumenta Serica, of the Institute. But he also had this passion, of course, uh, as a mission of his own congregation, of uh, his own Institute for the History of Christianity of China, and also in contemporary times. So, uh, I would say to a certain extent, uh, that is the truth. But um, Father Malatesta was also a scholar on his own uh, uh, right. He was a biblical scholar and he brought that 
kind of background to what he did. So his scholarship might have been more emotional when he it came to the history of Christianity in China, more personal also in some ways, but it was also very seriously based in the sources. And he had at his disposal the Rouleau collection. He worked closely with Father Rouleau in the last years of his life. And he used sources uh, in all kinds of languages because he could use them. He could read these documents. And I still remember one uh, incredible experience. He invited me and my advisor at Berkeley, Professor Fred Wakeman, to the Ritchie Institute and to visit a small apartment that he had rented outside of the campus of USF, where he would retreat in order to be completely isolated. There was no phone there. It, this is before, you know, cell phones and all of that. And he there had put most of the files of the Rouleau collection that he needed to work on his project on the Chinese rights controversy. This is the early 1990s. And he brought me and, and Fred Wakeman there. And I still remember Professor Wakeman later on, you know, saying, this was so wacky and crazy, you know, going into this uh, uh, little apartment with all this, uh, uh, copies of documents from the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, um, and uh, and being embedded, you know, embedded in this world of the Chinese rights controversy that was still going on, that to an extent is still going on today. It's something that starts in Fuan in 1635, the place that I became curious about, uh, Mindong, and to an extent continues by proxy through the generations to this day. You know, Paul Ru worked for many years at the Ritchie Institute on the Chinese rights controversy. He's still working with Fon Colani on publishing uh, the uh, Tournon mission papers. That's the Jesuit version of things. But in 1992, at my first uh, uh, academic conference in the US, in San Francisco, a few days after my arrival there to do my master studies, I went to the Chinese rights controversy conference organized by David Mungello. Uh, Jonathan Spence was uh, the keynote speaker. And Father Fidel Villaroel was there. And he was the archivist of the University of Santo Tomas. And he knew very well the Dominican point of view and the Dominican archives. And there he is presenting the Dominican point of view and saying, listen to us too. We also have a point of view. So it's kind of interesting to see how this was going on, uh, and uh, um, yeah, that, that's another episode that also brings in, you know, my, my experience at Berkeley, actually. I was trained there by Fred Wakeman, who always let me do what I wanted and respected really a field that uh, he didn't know firsthand. Of course, he was a great scholar of late imperial China. And then I worked with John, uh, David Johnson, who was interested in religion in late imperial China. He also let me work and he became interested in, in this. David Kitley, Ye Wenxing, you know, they were all very far away from my field, but they let me do what I wanted. And that, that was, and that worked so well with uh, the family that I found at the Ritchie Institute, Wu Xiaoxing, Mark Mir, all those people uh, that have succeeded uh, over the years there. Right. This is an interesting story that you mentioned, the story of, of finding your way into a field at a time uh, where in uh, the, this, the, the study of Christianity in China wasn't really considered a field in the, 18, in the 1980s and, and 1990s. And now, of course, it's so popular um, and it's a, its own field. Um, and, and certainly Father Malatesta and the, and the Ricci Institute, uh, people like Jonathan Spence, uh, John Fairbank, uh, Wakeman, these were people who, who believed that the study of Christianity in China was an important topic, even though it wasn't a field. Um, well, and that just actually leads in nicely to uh, the, the final question. And then if you don't mind, I'll ask you one more question afterward, because we have about 10 minutes. Um, the second, the, the, this last question then really is what hopes, and this is a question that young scholars, emerging scholars have, they really want me to ask more established scholars this question. What are your hopes for the future of this field? Yes, um, I would say that I have uh, hopes both for young scholars in uh, uh, the Sinophone world, and then I have des desiderata or hopes for those who are in the Western world. I'd start with 
the young scholars uh, in uh, uh, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, uh, the Sinophone world in general. I hope that, uh, and it's already starting to happen, I think, a little bit more, uh, that new scholars coming up uh, will take seriously the study of uh, other languages besides Chinese and English. Obviously, most Chinese scholars uh, have uh, an exceptional command of Chinese, very often, you know, incredible command of classical Chinese. And so, of course, they can do very often a much better job than a lot of, of the Western scholars in that respect. Most of them know English, uh, at least as a working language, and so they can read uh, sources in English. But what they really need to do more and more is uh, to be able to read materials that are a little bit more difficult and bring, uh, take the field to a new level of complexity. Um, they have to be able to read manuscripts. They have to be able to uh, read uh, languages beyond English. And so Latin, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, French, Manchu, uh, Japanese, um, German, Dutch, and so on. Obviously, it's impossible to know all these languages well enough, but at least to have a working knowledge of two other European languages beyond uh, mm -hmm. English is really important. If you want to study the French mission and you don't know French, forget about it. It's really very difficult. Um, study uh, Western paleography and uh, start to get uh, used to all documents. Uh, I admire some Chinese scholars like Han Qi, for example, who early on is the first scholar in China who really has gotten into uh, other languages, especially French, and has been able to uh, deal with uh, uh, archival materials in other languages. But uh, I think also Zhang Xianqing, who studied Spanish in order to be able to read materials about uh, the Mindong mission. Uh, you know, really that is very important. And I, I think now more and more of these young scholars are studying abroad, getting their doctorates in Europe, in the US, uh, and learning other languages. And I would really want the new generation to do that. Dong Xiaoxing, for example, at uh, Fudan University is now working with Portuguese materials and is uh, publishing Chinese translations of uh, the literary Anue in Portuguese. That's a fantastic source. Other scholars in previous generations have done so, and I hope uh, we will continue to see that. But even multilingualism, not just one language, not just Portuguese, but maybe Portuguese, uh, Spanish, Latin, because then you start putting things together with the Chinese sources, with the Manchu sources, and the picture becomes so much richer. And I'd say for Western scholars, uh, and here I think is the trend in, in the field in general, is to move beyond China and connect China with East Asia and with the global historical picture. And so um, I think that uh, this has already started happening in our field. People like Bang Elman, for example, uh, has started uh, several years ago to connect the history of Chinese uh, intellectual history with Korea, with Japan, Vietnam. And of course, this is the Sinophone world. This is happening all over the place uh, in the field of comparative literature. My colleague at uh, Boston University, Vipke Deneke, she's now moving to MIT, for example, is a pioneer uh, uh, and really someone who wants this uh, uh, creation of a Sinographic and a Sinophone sphere. Victor Mayer has been for a long time a uh, proponent of that uh, at uh, UPenn. But I would say that the Ritchie Institute at the University of San Francisco and Anthony Utzler has taken this uh, uh, tack, you know, really trying to connect Japan, China, Korea, Vietnam. I would even argue new scholars should move global. And we have had good examples of that, people who have studied uh, missionaries from different uh, countries. Uh, uh, Luke Clossy, for example, bringing together you know, German missionaries uh, in Latin America, the Philippines and China, uh, and others have done that. Um, but more and more, really connecting the places where these uh, foreigners came from with China and also with other places in Asia. 
including even South Asia, Southeast Asia, because, you know, and then move into the modern era. That's the other big, big important things we need to do. So far, we have uh, spent a lot of energy researching the old China mission. Of course, there's a lot of research on Protestant missions in modern times, but we need a new, a new generation of scholars that, for example, will explore more the Catholic side of things. And there, multilingualism is very important as well. You have sources in German, in Dutch, in French, uh, especially in those languages, also in Spanish, in Italian. Uh, you need to know those languages and to start looking at the archives and exploring sources that are totally unknown. And so with the help of archivists, uh, with the help of digital humanities projects, I myself uh, now am working here at BU and with other scholars, and I hope many will collaborate in China and all over the place uh, on uh, working, uh, on continuing the visionary work I talked uh, about before, the 21st century roundtable database, a, a prosopographical and geographic database using the newest technologies to see, you know, that there are hundreds of thousands of individuals in this uh, enterprise. And that really, for the history of modern China, uh, studying the history of Christianity in China is not something parochial. You mentioned before in the 80s, of course, there was still the backlash from uh, the anti-imperialist scholarship of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. But we are now beyond that. I think we don't need to write a geography. We don't need uh, to hide the ugly things of imperialism and the alliance of missions with imperialism. But we also have to understand that there is much more than that. That uh, modern China, in fact, uh, was uh, really um, influenced and uh, in vice versa influenced modern history. The book by uh, David Hollinger on Protestants abroad is really, I think, uh, uh, a very important intervention from 2017 by an American intellectual historian, a mainstream, a major American intellectual historian, not a missionary historian, who recognizes the importance on a global scale of missions. He looked at the Protestant ones. I would say that whoever studies Europe has to look also at the Catholic ones. They are equally important for the Catholic world. Um, and that really explains to you what? Not only that uh, Christianity has a role in the development of modern Chinese history, but also that uh, uh, Christianity, Christian missions influenced Europe, influenced America. You know, Henry Luce and his uh, publishing empire, Pearl Buck, the most famous uh, uh, American writer of the first half of the 20th century, and people can find that uh, uh, maybe surprising, and many criticized her for not being such uh, a great writer, and yet uh, her book uh, had a million uh, uh, copies sold, it was translated in dozen of languages. She, uh, according to Hollinger, was the most important uh, Westerner after Marco Polo in, in uh, presenting China to the West. So we, and this of course in turn also influenced the foreign policy of the country. You know, the Roosevelt administration was very influenced by people by, like Luce or uh, like Buck and so on. So we, we really need to keep this in mind. And, and the same is true of Europe. If you start studying the importance of missions for French foreign policy, uh, you know, very often missionaries were the ones who knew the most in their own countries at any given time, uh, together with a, ha a handful of diplomats, but they actually, missionaries had a much deeper knowledge of the country. They were in the countryside. They, they knew the language. They knew uh, the culture so much more deeply. They were the ones who actually presented the Chinese popular culture uh, to their congregations. I still remember as a young man uh, being in church and Catholic churches in, and there is the, you know, the World Mission Day and the missionary comes and talks about Africa, talks about uh, Latin America, talks about Asia and presents uh, objects from those places. I mean, some of it might be paternalistic, some of it might be uh, down to the level of the congregation, maybe not scholarly. 
but it is a moment when the world comes into these very parochial places. And this was happening in the 1910s, 1920s, all over America, all over Europe. The first time people heard about China, heard about Africa, heard about these places, was in these circumstances. And uh, missionaries were um, the mavericks of their ages, very often. They were the ones who left everything and went uh, and often went native. Sometimes they were uh, imperialist pigs, but very often they were uh, people who uh, converted themselves into these new places and, uh, and tried to understand them. Right. You know, I th this last remark that you made makes me think of Vincent Leb, um, who was this, this great example of someone who becomes very native and, and uh, uh, sort of integrated within the culture. You, you mentioned two things in, 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 in your hopes. One is this idea of a more globalized uh, form of research, especially among Western scholars. And then in, in, the, in the, the realm of the Sinophone world, you, you recommend expanding one's mastery of languages. And in both cases, you know, I think there's hope, right? I mean, I'm thinking of Li Ji, for example, who's, who's Chinese, who speaks English, who's now teaching in Hong Kong, and whose research was at the um, Mission Etrangère de Paris and wrote about French sources. So it, it seems like um, your, your wishes are sort of becoming uh, actualized. Yes. Yeah, I think it is true. And also, there has been a lot of work done in China by several institutions, uh, at, for example, Beiwai, Beijing Wai Yudashi, Foreign Studies University, there they have an institute for foreign sinology. They have done a lot of publications. They have nurtured a new generation of scholars at Fudan University, uh, Li Tiangan, uh, and now Dong Xiaoxing have been trained scholars uh, working in these fields. Uh, so Zhang Xianqing himself is an example of this. Uh, there are several scholars who have done this, and I think it's becoming more common. Mm -hmm. And really, I have high hopes that more and more of these young scholars will really continue doing this work. And I hope that there will be no political interference. This is actually one of the great worries. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, uh, scholars in China are a little bit worried about this. Mm -hmm. The fact that uh, the pipeline of young scholars might uh, uh, be in danger because young scholars might find that studying Christianity in China is uh, sensitive in the new political climate. And they would rather study something that is uh, less uh, uh, dangerous for their own careers. So I participated at a few conferences recently, and this was one of the questions of this young PhD student saying, will I find a job? Will I be able to have a career? And their mentors are a little bit worried about that. Right. Um, and self-censoring is not good in scholarship in general. So I hope that the Chinese government uh, will not uh, uh, harden its own ideological stance going forward, because this will only damage things. Right. Also true, uh, there are Chinese scholars who are getting their PhDs abroad more and more, staying abroad, and so they're bringing their own Chinese uh, strengths and learning new strengths. What just happened with Hong Kong doesn't bode well for the future because uh, that was an important center of East-West uh, encounter where scholars could really do uh, incredible scholarship, especially on Protestant Christianity, given the history of Hong Kong. Can they do that now? Can they continue doing it as they did it before? I'm not sure. I hope so. Right. Yeah, I, I, uh, be, I, we do have a few more minutes, and I want to ask you one more short question. Um, but I do hear a lot of Chinese scholars say, uh, after liberation is still a sensitive topic. And you mentioned how much it, I think we do need to fill in these lacunae, these, these vacuums of information. We have sources about after 1949, but so few people, uh, at least in China, are willing to publish about that period. But let me ask you one last question, um, given that we just have a couple more minutes to, to, uh, for this interview. Um, well, I've been asked to ask you what now? What for in terms of your own scholarly work, we this this digital project is so exciting, and I know that's underway. We know you're working on Beijing. Could you just provide a few comments about what what you see in your own future, in terms of your scholarship? 
Well, I would like to complete this uh, book on the Europeans in Beijing during the long 18th century, which is a book about uh, networking on the Qing court, but also global networking, because the more I studied Beijing, the more I realized the importance of the Pearl River Delta, of Canton, Macau, and uh, the maritime connections. Uh, without Canton, without Macau, Beijing, the Beijing uh, uh, European uh, uh, churches could have never survived. Uh, money, objects, uh, correspondence, uh, personnel, everything had to come by ship and everything had to come through that special place. And so I have uh, uh, discovered more and more sources and I have moved uh, my interest also to Canton, realizing that these networks actually were uh, down into the south, but then of course they went off into the world. And so I really think that we are moving to that direction and digital humanities is the way to go to an extent. That's why I am participating with Darrow Ireland, Alex Mayfield, Professor Liu Xiang at Renmin University and the Ritchie Institute at the University of San Francisco. And we hope more partners in the future in this new venture, this digital humanities venture, the China Historical Christian Database that we hope to launch by the end of 2021. And this is really this global vision, understanding that actually China cannot be seen in isolation, that uh, a letter traveling from Rome to Beijing in the middle of the 18th century might have gone through New Spain, the Philippines, to the hands of so many different people, uh, friendly merchants, French, Spanish, Protestant merchants uh, helping Catholic missionaries. And then of course, Chinese merchants uh, transporting through the Grand Canal, these correspondence, uh, these objects. And then, you know, the work of someone like Harrietta Harrison, myself, many others have shown the Chinese also were traveling outside of China. They were going to Naples. I mean, Michele Fatica is now publishing soon the third volume of the memoirs on Matteo Ripa, showing you know, this, this, the fact that Chinese are going out. They are traveling. They are becoming themselves a testimonial, even in the early mission. But then, of course, much more in the modern period when you have uh, so many uh, lay Chinese and Chinese pastors becoming the leaders of their own churches. So, and traveling abroad and becoming also diffused through the overseas Chinese communities. So I really hope that myself will become more and more uh, connected globally, looking at uh, um, this kind of networks and that other scholars will pitch in and we all will work on understanding how connected the world was already back then. Right. Well, um, we are just at that moment where I, I we should be we should conclude. Um, I should say this is a good opportunity for me uh, to thank you personally for your your life of scholarship and work. Uh, your work has been just. I'm not in my home office now, but when I'm in my home office, your work is literally just here. So uh, it's, it's been a great help for me and I know a, a great deal of scholars and, um, and I, I really appreciate your final remark about the importance of collaboration. Um, I almost think, you know, uh, that maybe Zoom will help us in the future uh, to, to collaborate more uh, uh, as, as a community of scholars. But let me just uh, end here and say thank you so much for this, for this uh, uh, interview. And we're, we're grateful to you and, and, and grateful for your work. So thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity. And also, of course, I'm not dead yet. And uh, I hope uh, to be able to contribute, continue contributing. I always feel that I haven't done enough. Uh, uh, I'll do what I can. Uh, and yes, I agree with you. Let's work together because uh, we always stand on the shoulders of the giants who came before us. Right. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh -huh.